Thank you for joining me this morning. Today we are going to cover a basic approach to a CT abdomen and pelvis search pattern. When I start with a CT abdomen and pelvis, I will begin in the lungs. And I think about dividing the lungs into four quadrants. I'll look at the anterior right lung and the posterior right lung, the anterior left lung and the posterior left lung. And notice that we are in a lung window that gives us good resolution of air spaces. After I've cleared the lungs, I will then return to a soft tissue window and I'm gonna look at the heart. I'm gonna look for any evidence of cardiomegaly or pericardial effusion. If I have pulmonary arteries included within the field of view, I'm going to look for any evidence of pulmonary emboli. Finally, I'm going to look at the soft tissues of the chest wall, including the breasts, for any masses or calcifications. After we've looked at the chest, we're going to move on to the abdomen and pelvis, and we're going to start with the solid organs. I first begin with the liver, looking at the left hemi liver. In this particular case, we can see a little bit of hypodensity along the falciform ligament which is commonly focal fat and seen in much of our population. I will then look at the right hemi liver for any nodules or masses, um, moving back and forth through the liver, making sure I've covered the entirety of the liver. Next, I will start by looking at the gallbladder, following the gallbladder within the gallbladder fossa, looking for any wall thickening, stones, or adjacent fluid or inflammation. Next, I will look at the common bile duct, starting here in the hilum of the liver, and I'll follow the common bile duct down through the periportal space into the pancreatic head to where it would join with the pancreatic duct and empty into the duodenum. Next, I will track the pancreas up through the retroperitoneum, looking at the pancreatic parenchyma for any nodules or masses and any evidence of pancreatic duct dilation. After the pancreas, I will move to the spleen in the left upper quadrant, Again, looking for nodules or masses, and also looking for any evidence of splenic enlargement when the spleen is normal. I will then move to the adrenal glands, which sit just above the kidneys. You can see the lateral and medial limbs of the left adrenal gland here without any nodule or mass. We'll then look at the right adrenal gland, uh, and next we'll move on to the kidneys. In the kidneys, I'm looking for normal cortical medullary differentiation. I'm looking for evidence of cysts, nodules, or masses. I'm looking at the collecting system for any evidence of hydronephrosis. And I'm going to do that for both the right and left kidney. After I've looked at the kidneys, I'm going to look at the ureters. I'm going to follow the ureters down through the retroperitoneum along the psoas muscle. The ureter will then, as we approach the pelvis, cross over the iliac vessels. And as we move into the pelvis, it can be much harder to track the ureter. But the ureter in this case is normal, non-dilated, and does not have any stones. I will then sometimes track the right ureter back up, but it's often harder to track it up than down, but I can still follow that right ureter and look along its expected course, following that ureter all the way back into the right kidney. Again, no dilation, no masses, nodules, or stones. After I've looked at the ureters, I'm going to come down and look at the bladder. This person's bladder is relatively distended, uh, but is otherwise normal. Next, I'm going to look at the uterus. The uterus uh, has a wide array of normal enhancement patterns. This person's uterus is relatively heterogeneous, but likely normal. She has a, a left ovary sitting here next to the uterus, and the right ovary is actually over here along the pelvic sidewall. And after I've cleared the uterus, I am then going to go back all the way up to the top of the study, and we're going to start on the GI tract. So now I can see the esophagus. I'm looking for any nodules, masses, dilation, or thickening, any evidence of reflux. I'm looking at the gastroesophageal junction. And now I'm looking at the stomach. I'm looking at the thickness of the wall of the stomach, whether it's distended, whether there are any filling defects within it. It's very common to have some gas and air fluid levels or ingested material within the stomach. We go to the antrum, the pylorus. This is a little bit of gas within the duodenal bulb. In this particular patient, they were administered oral contrast. Most of that oral contrast is actually passed beyond the upper GI tract into the small bowel. So now we can see the jejunum here in the left abdomen. We have a normal wall thickness, normal jejunal fold pattern, no dilation, no evidence of stricture or mass. The mesentery looks nice and clean. That jejunum is gradually going to transition over into ileum. I am often not 
tracing the entirety of the small bowel unless there's specific concern for small bowel pathology or malignancy, or I notice an abnormality of the small bowel that could indicate an obstruction or inflammation. Now we get into the jejunum. The small bowel then transitions to ileum. The looks like the oral contrast in this patient hasn't quite made it to the ileum, but you can see the ileum is decompressed, normal in caliber, normal in location. I'm then going to turn my attention to the ileocecal valve. So that's right where that terminal ileum comes into the cecum, a place where there is often a lot of pathology. And then finally, we're going to look uh, for the appendix. So here we have the normal appendix. It's sitting just posterior to the cecum, and it's normal in caliber, and it's uh, sitting just right there along the psoas, so a retro cecal appendix. Next, we're going to turn our attention to the colon. Again, we're looking for dilation, we're looking for wall thickening, we're looking for adjacent inflammation or fluid, we're looking for masses. We make it all the way up to the hepatic flexure, and the colon is normal. We can see that there is kind of this mottled gas throughout the colon, which is stool within the colon, a completely normal finding. We're also looking for areas of diverticula, which tend to concentrate in the left colon, uh, any colonic inflammation again, masses or obstruction. We don't see any of that. We can trace the colon all the way down to the rectum and the anus, and then look in the, in the perineal region for any soft tissue abnormalities, which we do not see. After we have looked at the gastrointestinal tract, I'm going to look at the mesentery. Okay, the mesentery uh, kind of follows the vessels, so we can see the superior mesenteric vein and its branches coursing through the mesentery. We're looking for nodules, masses, inflammation, or lymphadenopathy through the mesentery. Sometimes I like to go to a coronal, especially in somebody who has not a lot of mesenteric fat. And you can really see this branching structure of the superior mesenteric vein and the way that the vascular drainage and supply uh, to the small bowel is nicely laid out in that coronal. So nice use of the coronal imaging for looking at the mesentery. Next, we're going to look at the vascular system. So again, starting with that SMV, I'm going to follow that up to the portosplenic confluence, which sits right about here. Okay, And then we've got our splenic vein headed over to the spleen. We've got our portal vein. We don't see any, any filling defects or other abnormalities. I'm going to look at my hepatic veins, which are going to come together, the left, middle, and right hepatic veins at the IVC. Um, then I'm going to follow that IVC down and making sure it's normal in caliber, that we don't see any filling defects or other abnormalities. It's going to split into our iliac veins here. And those iliac veins, again, I'm looking for filling defects, inflammation, dilation, or narrowing of the vessels. And we don't see any of that. We're going to then go back all the way up to the top and start looking at our aorta. So we can follow the aorta down. The first branch is going to be that celiac axis, which trifurcates into the left gastric artery, the splenic artery, and the common hepatic artery. And then I'm going to look at that superior mesenteric artery. And actually, in this case, there is an anatomic variant where their common hepatic artery is coming off the superior mesenteric artery. Next, we're going to look at our two renal arteries, make sure we don't have any accessory renal arteries, continue to follow the aorta down and we'll see the branch of the IMA come off, and that looks nice and normal. We now have the aortic bifurcation into our iliac arteries. We're gonna follow those arteries down and back, okay? Down and back, looking at the internal iliacs, looking at the external iliacs, looking at each external iliac bifurcating into our superficial femoral and profundiferous arteries on both sides. And here we have no abnormality. As we were looking at the vasculature, I'm also trying to be aware of any lymphadenopathy. So particularly retroperitoneal lymphadenopathy, pelvic lymphadenopathy along our iliac chains, and inguinal lymphadenopathy. I'm also looking at the mesentery um, for, again, any lymphadenopathy. And then finally, looking in our periportal region. We don't see any abnormalities in terms of lymph nodes. Lastly, we're going to look for free fluid. So free fluid likes to settle in dependent locations. So in the upper abdomen, we're looking along that interface between the liver and the diaphragm, the interface between the spleen and the diaphragm. We're looking at the inferior margins of the spleen and the liver. 
We're looking at Morrison's pouch, a peritoneal recess between the right kidney and the liver. And then we're looking along the colon in what we call the pericolic gutters. And so those pericolic gutters can often contain fluid. And finally, we're looking at the dependent portions of the pelvis, particularly the rectouterine pouch in women or the rectovesical pouch, which is a deep pelvic peritoneal recess. We don't see any free fluid, so we're feeling pretty good about this case. The last thing we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the body wall. We're gonna look in the inguinal regions for inguinal hernias. We're gonna look along midline for any paraumbilical hernias or prior incisional hernias. We're looking at the muscles to make sure they're symmetric and uniform. We're gonna look at the central canal of the spine to make sure we don't see any nodules, masses, or central canal narrowing. And then finally, we're gonna to go to a bone window. So that bone window gives us nice corticomedullary differentiation. Okay, we're going to look at the ribs that are within our field of view, okay, back and forth, looking along those ribs, making sure we don't see nodules or masses. We're then going to focus on the vertebral bodies and the posterior elements and the facet joints as we move down, making sure they're symmetric, making sure there's no irregularities or lytic or sclerotic lesions. We're then going to look at our sacroiliac joints. We're going to look at our femoral heads and our acetabula. We're going to look at the pubic symphysis. Okay. And then the last thing to do, and this is critical in every case, is to pull up your sagittal imaging, put that into a bone window, and really look at the vertebral column for any malalignment or compression fractures, which can be very easy to miss on axial imaging. We're then going to scroll through and look at our facet joints. We're going to look at the facet joints both sides. We're going to take another look at our femoral head and the acetabulum, our iliac, ischium, okay, pubic bones, iliac, ischium, pubic bones on both sides. Again, everything looking good in this patient. That concludes my tutorial on a basic search pattern of a CT of the abdomen and pelvis. Thank you for your time and attention.